Well, let's pray again before we consider biblical truth, as we always do. Pray with me, church. Father, thank you for another opportunity to consider things that matter so much to us in your word, because they matter so much to you. Help us to learn, help us to submit our hearts to what your word reveals, and not our own opinions, not other people's opinions, but, but your truth, your opinion. That's what really matters to us. So help us to see and then align our hearts to what your scriptures reveal. We say this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, people everywhere have opinions about how to make society better. Now things oftentimes, as we look around, seem to be getting worse (laughs) in so many er arenas of public life. We could wonder what's going on, but everyone's got an opinion and everybody's got thoughts, right? You got governors or presidents or kings of old, monarchs, law enforcement, crowds and masses, and just everyday people like you and me. We all have our thoughts, don't we, about how things can and should be and get better. But what does Scripture put forward for us? And how does our church doctrine even help us to think through this important issue? This leads us right into Article 15 of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 on the Christian and the social order. And let's just walk through it together like we normally do. And point one, we want to present Christ as supreme to all. Let's see the first part of the Baptist Faith and Message, Article 15, together. All Christians are under obligation to seek to make the will of Christ supreme in our own lives and in human society. Means and methods used for the improvement of society and the establishment of righteousness among men can truly can be truly and permanently helpful only when they are rooted in the regeneration of the individual by the saving grace of God in Jesus Christ. We need to present Christ as supreme to all. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 17 helps us even more in this. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, talking about believers there, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, these things put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So, The context here is the local church and is Christians and Christian love and action, right? You see that. You might be like, Daniel, why are you talking about the Christian and social order outside of the church? This just seems to be only in the church. Well, let's read on. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Still related to the church, right? But look at verse 17. And whatever you do, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I think that applies to whatever we do in the church. It's not like what, what you do in the church you need to do in the name of Jesus and give thanks to him and in word and deed be Christ-like. But outside of the church, you can live however you want. Do you think that's what the Bible teaches? No, no, no. Everywhere, whatever we do in word and deed. Christ is supreme, but we must be witnesses and present a kind of apologetic to the world, giving answers for the hope that is in us, as we see in 1 Peter 3.15. 
Our lives should be presenting that. How, how are you doing in presenting the hope that you have and biblical character and convictions and truth to the fallen world around us? Whatever we do, in word or action or deed, everything we say, everything we act, how, how are we doing in that? How can we grow in that? What's your witness like? What are your words and what are your deeds? That you ask yourself. It's a good thing to think at the end of the day before you go to sleep or in the morning when you get ready. Maybe before you go to sleep, how were my words and deeds reflecting the supremacy of Christ in my life to those around me? And then when you wake up, Lord, help me that my words and deeds would reflect the supremacy of Christ in all things. You think that's a good prayer to pray morning and evening? I think, I think that's good for us. And our means and methods, as we saw here, should be derived from biblical revelation and biblical principles. Not just chapter and verse, but also deductions from Scripture. Because we could make conclusions about truths from Scripture that apply to all areas of life. But then notice that while our position that might have influence over society is objectively good, it is good, a Christian position, a Christian witness. It's objectively good. But if those in society are not converted individuals and trusting Christ, the impact will only be temporary. Do you see that? We might put forward good character and action and, and even put forward good biblical true ideas that are for human flourishing. But if people aren't connected with and converted and are not born again and become Christians, you see, that's just not going to do any good for them eternally. Temporarily, there might be some good things going on, but there needs to be a change of heart in order to not only just, you know, experience these blessings, but also internally have these things true for ourselves. Does that make sense? The Baptist faith and message, and, and we as Christians, I think, is, is important that we promote not a kind of social gospel of simply making society better as like the ultimate aim and the, the ultimate purpose of all things. Though we do not oppose to society getting better, we are concerned most supremely with people's eternal position before a holy God, right? And we realize that society cannot be saved by adopting biblical principles while rejecting the biblical gospel. Does that make sense? There's been movements in the past that is called the social gospel, and really the ethical norms and pursuits are like the be-all and end-all. That's the most important thing, and that is kind of how we save our world and save our culture by making these social changes. That's a social gospel. We don't hold to the social gospel. The Baptist faith and message doesn't promote the social gospel. It recognizes, though we may be witnesses and we should, if somebody's not converted, all of our witness will, will, will end temporarily but not deal with people's eternal destinies. Is that, is that helpful? Hopefully that makes sense. But we should, of course, present Christ as supreme to all as Christians. This leads us to the second point and second portion of the church's doctrine, and that is number two, uphold biblical ethics in all areas. So present Christ as supreme to all, but now in all areas uphold, defend, put forward biblical Christian ethics in all areas. Let's see it in the Baptist faith and message in this middle section here. It says, in the spirit of Christ, Christians should oppose racism. Every form of greed, selfishness, and vice, and all forms of sexual immorality, including adultery, homosexuality, and pornography. We should provide for the orphaned, the needy, and the abused, the aged, the helpless, the sick. We should speak on behalf of the unborn and contend for the sanctity of all human life from conception to natural death. Uphold biblical ethics in all areas. 
Micah 6, 8 says this. He has told you, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And then in James 2, 8, it says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Believers are to do justice all the way way back into the old covenant as we saw in Micah and into the new covenant. We're to love kindness, walk humbly before our God. And the James passage we just read in James chapter 2 has within its context not showing favoritism, which relates to other areas of Christian ethics, even in this list. But also, we just need to know that our loving our neighbor well is pointing to their flourishing, which includes the Christian ethic. People are not better off pursuing worldly, godless ethics or cultish ethics or the ethics of other world religions that are coming against the truths of Christianity, they're not better off. The way we love our neighbor is by putting forward what God puts forward. I think this is really, really important because in a day and age, everybody's calling out Christians for being bigots, for being on the wrong side of history, and it's almost like we've got to like be in defense mode for just historic biblical Christian ethics that Christians throughout the history of the world have upholded. And in fact, even our culture, even the world, just even like think of the United States, even 20, 30 years ago looked way different than it does today, right? We, we see that, we know that. So we need to remember that, hey, when we're putting these things forward, it may seem mean and terrible and awful to other people who don't have eyes to see and hearts to receive. We can do it in a loving way, but we do it, why? Because we know it's for their good and flourishing. These other things are for their bad and destruction. Does that make sense? And the list is really robust there. And it's even gotten better with this 2000, Baptist Faith and Message 2000 edition, in the update, because before, the older version in the 60s didn't include, for instance, the sanctity of human life, because that was before Roe versus Wade in the 70s, which we're really glad now also that Roe versus Wade was, was overturned in the Dobbs decision, but you see how there are new things to speak to, and that's why those who were a part of updating the Baptist faith and message in 2000 included that really, really important aspect of Christian ethics. So that's really good. But the list, though, it's really robust. (laughs) We can see here things that are missing too, right? We we can see that there are other biblical areas of ethics um, that we can and should defend from Scripture. And one quick example of this would be the sad pursuit of some in our day and age wanting to promote uh, the gender dysphoria as a legitimate and healthy thing to even pursue and encourage, and even going so far as providing gender reassignment surgery for for children. Now, we can be compassionate about hurting hearts and confused people, and we should be. It's so sad, the confusion. It's not for their flourishing. It's not for that child's flourishing or the adult's flourishing. No one's flourishing. We can be compassionate, and we must be, not because we're better than other people, looking at them in judgment, but, but seeing that we have, by God's grace, been freed from the, the confusion of our world, and we must show and uphold biblical truth that God created, what, good gender and good marriage, as we saw in our Genesis series. That's just one example of many others we might add of things that might not be explicitly in this list, and we can and should be constantly kind of considering scriptural ethics and promoting truth in all areas of life, even with the changing games of of things that are going on in our day and age and in our world. It's important for us to be thinking biblically in light of what's going on all around us. 
Well, let's quickly walk through our confession of faith on all the good that it does include. There's a lot that it does include. This is important for us to be on the same page with and to put forward. We must oppose racism as evil and wicked because, as we also saw in our Genesis series, racism is not only sinful, it's foolish and illogical because all nations stemmed from and share the same first parents of Adam and Eve and then Noah and his family after the, the flood, the, the nations were scattered, to be sure, at Babel, but were all connected image bearers of God with dignity and worth, which is why any kind of favoritism like James 2 that we might show based on skin color and background and upbringing and things is just so wrong and wicked and sinful as your pastor, and, and I want to point us to our church's doctrine and say, none of that in our lives or in our church, none of it, because it's just so unchristian, right? I'm glad it's in the confession. And then we see greed and selfishness. <laughs> Christians should be generous and not looking out just for themselves, so we do well to oppose all forms of greed in business or our personal living or in all arenas of public life. We could just apply that to so many areas and living with the fruit of the Spirit as Christians, we know that we're not to be greedy and selfish, so we're going to personally put that forward, but then we're also going to kind of think through the flourishing of our world and our church and other things and community. We want to make sure that we're not promoting and actually speaking against greed and selfishness. And related to the example that I mentioned before, that's not explicitly in the Baptist faith in message 2000, because a lot has changed in a little over 20 years, right? But here's, it's kind of cool in the confession, it says, what does it say? It says, every form of vice. So that includes a huge bucket of additional things, right? So we can add to that bucket of vice. It, it reminds me of scripture where, where, where Paul says, you know, he lists all the works of the flesh, and he says what? And things like these. So there's additional bucket just in case something was not listed that you, that, that's in view. Things like these. Then a rather large bu- bucket is in the ethics relating to sexual sin and sexual immorality. Did you see that? The Bible talks about, um, as we saw this morning, even greater degrees in this uniquely personal and consequential reality of sexual sin against our bodies. And I didn't mention this verse this morning, but 1 Corinthians 6.18 I think is really instructive for us just to see how weighty all forms of sexual sin can be. It says, 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Sexual sin includes all sexual immorality, but the confession of faith points out a few, like adultery, when someone is married and has sexual relations with someone who's not their spouse. We can add to this, it's not in there. Fornication, when unmarried people have sexual relationships when they're they're not married, outside of any kind of a covenant, that's rampant throughout our world. And I preached two evening sermons, actually, In Proverbs 5 and 6, the last couple years, most of you would have missed that uh, or might not have been there, but I point to you that the Proverbs in Scripture all over, and specifically very vividly in Proverbs 5 and 6, warns us of the dangers of sexual sin and temptation, like an ox going to the slaughter is pierced. It may look good, but it hurts you, and so the Bible speaks against that, so I think it's good that our Baptist faith and message speaks to that. Then there's here, we see homosexuality, which Paul in Romans 1 says and that, it, that it's just another form of sexual deviation and degradation, and it's sinful and, and, and needs to be repented of. But just to point out, the heterosexual sinner and the homosexual sinner are both sinning grievously in sexual sin and must repent. So it's not like we could look to someone else who struggles and other types of sin in a kind of, you know, judgment saying, I'm perfect in this area, in all areas, and you're just an abomination. No, 
all forms of sexual sin is an abomination, is sinful, and should be repented of. The biblical worldview points to the flourishing of a husband and a wife being married and, and committed covenant and union. That's what's good for sexual intimacy. Everything outside of a man and a woman is bad for sexual engagement. And, and, and eh, the, the confusion of our world is spoken to in Scripture, and I'm thankful that it's in the Baptist faith and message. Our confession also, speaking of all types of sexual sin, it mentions pornography as a sinful vice of sexual immorality. And as Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mountain, we saw lust is secret adultery that no one else knows or sees necessarily, but is still sinful and destructive and has no place in the Christian life. It should be repented of. And the number, sadly of those who partake and consume pornography is staggering, even numbers in churches. And with all the devices that, are, that everyone has instant access to, we would be wise as Christians to do whatever we can to be wise with those devices to block and keep ourselves from that instant access to all forms of sexual immorality and pornography. And we should do that for ourselves and we should also do that for our children because there's so much destruction in those things and we will seek and we will glorify God if we look to repent from those things and it will be good for you and your family and our community and everyone. It could seem like, oh, it's a secret sin. It doesn't affect anybody. It affects you. And it affects others around you, whether you know it or not, good for us to repent of it. Good that it's in the Baptist faith and message. If you need help and encouragement in any of that, I as your pastor or Pastor Wood or other, I seek or there's other software and other advice and other biblical wisdom and truth out there to help with the snare of that form of sexual sin that's all around us. We should also... As it says in our article 15 here, work to provide for orphan, the needy, the abused, the aged, the helpless, and the sick. The abused could fall also into the sexual immorality area because there's all forms of sexual wickedness and sin and abuse. We need to oppose that. Anybody who's been hurt by that knows how devastating that is. We need to protect against that in our church, in our homes, in our community, because of how consequential that is. My heart goes out to anybody who would be abused in any form, any form. Christianity speaks directly against it. God speaks against it. Our Baptist faith and message speaks against it. There's no place for any types of abuse. We need to help those who are hurting in those ways. Because often they're the silent minority, but the number, as we're seeing in different reports, even tied to information at other churches in our convention of churches, the numbers are, are, seem to be growing, and there's a reality that it needs to be on our radar. The orphaned, also the needy, the helpless, the sick. Isn't that just a Christian heart? What does James say? It's just true religion, helping what orphans and widows. This is a biblical worldview. We know that. It's good to be reminded of it. Let's live in light of it. And then the last portion here is we should speak on behalf of the unborn. This is what was added. And contend for the sanctity of all human life from conception to natural death. This past year, I preached four sermons, two in Psalm 139, putting forward the biblical worldview that we're image bearers even in the womb, even at conception, and that we should not destroy image bearers. We know that's a Christian worldview. It ties to our Baptist faith and message. And then we also would be against any kind of euthanasia or infanticide or, or anything like that from young or old. This is just really important Christian ethics. And we need to, as Christians, uphold biblical ethics in all areas. And this leads us really, really, really quickly to point number three in the end of our confession. And number three, seek to make things better for all. Baptist Faith and Message says, every Christian should seek to bring industry, government, and society as a whole under the sway of the principles of righteousness, truth, 
and brotherly love. In order to promote these ends, Christians should be ready to work with all men of goodwill and any good cause, always being careful to act in the spirit of love without compromising their loyalty to Christ and his truth. Matthew chapter 6 and verses 13 through 16 says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Christians should be certainly making a difference in everything and in, with everyone around them. And we should be making things better because we have the Holy Spirit and we have God's truth for human flourishing. Do you believe that? Don't be sheepish in that. Just start comparing yourself to other worldviews and what they put forward for human flourishing. And you'll see really, really quickly how chaotic and confused it is. Know and stand on the truth and put it forward for the good of people around us. We need to promote these things as salt and light and work with others who promote these things. But, of course, as it says, avoid godless compromise along the way in this world, according to conscience, and ensure that we are living and acting in truth. It's really important for us to know this, too. We are not a, a, you know, a theocracy like Old Testament Israel, where in the Old Covenant you had a whole government, everything set up as prescribed from Scripture, and the people of God, <laughs> everything was kind of built out in this unique way in the Old Covenant that's a lot different than we see today. So we're not looking to create a state church or a country church or, I mean, country as in the United States or other. We're not, in history, whenever those types of things have happened, it's usually been for really bad. And, 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 and talk about spiritual apathy that we talked about this morning. You know, if being a citizen meant you needed to be baptized, and which is true of different nations throughout the world, um, can you imagine that there would be a lot of confusion spiritually in that kind of a context? We're not talking about setting up a world order as, as Christians or something like that. The, the church uh, has a mission in the Great Commission, and in its part of the Great Commission is not set up a Christian government like we see in, into the Old Covenant and, and just, you know, make, every, make the church and the state the same in that way. We're not saying that, but we should realize that our workplaces should be better because of Christians in it. We're salt and light. We make an impact. We should, as Christians, vote our conscience informed by Scripture to make government and things better because of Christians in it. This is just clear implications from Matthew 6 here. All of society should be seasoned with Christians' grace and mercy and love as we're salt and light. Don't hide your Christianity. Display it for other people's goods. And put it forward because it really is for their good. And be confident that it's really for their good. And in all these things, we need God's help. So I'm going to close in prayer, asking for his help in everything we've considered. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, that you reveal in your word truths that relate to our everyday lives. They don't just stop here and end here on Sunday morning after we worship or they're just not over when we have gatherings and do spiritual things, but they affect every area of our lives. Thank you for your word speaking into things for us to give us wisdom and direction. Help us to be witnesses. Help us to be not only just witnesses, but, but godly, mature, seasoned, salt and light that's attractive to those who are lost while not compromising at all, Lord. We don't want to compromise, but we want to put forward truth in love, so that we might make an impact on those around us. We need help in these things. Would you help us in these things, Lord? We say this in Jesus' name.